Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ancient Warfare Answers with me, Murray. Uh, welcome to your 10-minute fix of Ancient Warfare Weekly, and um, I will attempt to answer a question, this time from Witten. I think I've got that name right. Uh, of course, you can ask us a question, as you know. Uh, you can join us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Ancient Warfare Podcast. You can become a supporter uh, of the magazine and of the podcast, and you can get a copy of the magazine if you back us at the right level there's legionary optio and century uh you can send us an email you can answer ask a question on one of the comments on one of the previous ones however you like however you can get hold of us stop me in the street but you have to come to sydney australia to do that anyway i've got a question this time from wooden very short question uh during the republic what were the roman italian allies armed with and how did they fight as legionaries or as some other method Right. So this is uh, a fascinating one. There's lots of recent debate about this question in more general terms, in terms of what was the early Roman legion look like and, and the idea of what's described in the literature as misleading uh, and misleadingly organized, shall we say, uh, that war bands are probably a more likely kind of uh, designation. The Italian peninsula, uh, the enemies and then the allies of Italy as their empire in Italy grew in the 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th centuries BC, generally speaking, are all city-states and they are all roughly heavy infantry based. I think in all Italian societies, uh, you got the elite who were generally called equites of some kind or, or, or hippies in Greek, and they are able to afford horses and may have at one time served as cavalry. But then as the the domination of heavy infantry comes to the sort of the fore politically, uh, you've got the idea that, of course, they are form the heaviest, best equipped and most uh, outlandishly decorated infantry. So your heaviest infantry are your wealthiest class. And that's, again, mirroring the Roman model. But we seem to have a very similar kind of idea in the surviving archaeological record of the the best preserved items of the tombs uh, from Lucania and elsewhere are phenomenally high quality and suggest rich uh, individuals and rich noble families who fought in that way. So, uh, you know, you've got the Mars of Todi, which has got this amazing um, Tuban yoke armor, 5th, 4th century. You've got Etruscan helmets, Proto-Corinthians, and all those sorts of things. You've got also some of the tombs, and obviously some of them are better preserved for the Roman allies than they are for Rome. And they too also seem to show hoplite-esque. Um, there's a, there's a, again, there's another trend in, in Roman warfare to not talk about a Roman phalanx, to not talk about Roman hoplite, hoplites. They may not have fought as a, as a Greek hoplite phalanx the way that uh, the Greek cities of mainland Greece and then Magna Graecia did. But you certainly have similar equipment. They've got tube and yoke or linothorax armor. They've got round shields to start with, although we do find some oval shields. And they're generally depicted as heavy spearmen. And again, most of them are carrying heavy thrusting spears rather than heavy or, or even light throwing spears. Uh, you do have depictions of some uh, cavalry as well. Uh, so such as the the freezers and Nola. But again, you've got armor of various different types. Uh, you've got uh, linothorax from from the sort of the Greek tradition, but you've also got the uh, pectorale, the, the, the metal plates that cover the chest area, the vulnerable bits, uh, and other sorts of depictions of uh, cuirasses and things like that. Uh, they're wearing greaves, they're wearing helmets, crested helmets, and they're carrying spears generally. Um, sometimes, of course, in some of these depictions, we're not shown swords, which is which is peculiar because we generally think of these kinds of soldiers as having both swords and spears. You've got everything from light arm troops all the way through to heavy troops. And I think that's probably one of the things is that each of these city states or these states, as we call the Samnites, the Etruscans, the other groups, um, I've got a list here. Where's my list? Uh, you know, you've got them. And and as as Rome's empire expands, of course, each of these gets absorbed to become the Soki, uh, who then fight a war of their own at the end of the Republic. Um, so you've got the Latins first, of course, 
then you've got um, the the people of Magna Graecia uh, in southern Italy and Sicily, uh, Etruscans, Campanians. Some of the Gauls, of course, famously in 390, they come down and uh, sack Rome. And then the Ligurians, the Misapi and things like that. So what you've got there in each of those, I think, is a combination of heavy infantry, generally made up of the wealthiest. You've got lighter infantry, men who are not quite as well equipped, but are striving to be better equipped. You've got all the way down to the, the lightest armed troops who are fighting with whatever they've got. And I think that the the way that warfare evolves of these troop types is you've got heavy infantry who form the bulk of your battle and who, who do the glorious fighting. And then you've got light troops who support, uh, whether it be from behind or on the flanks. Uh, and of course, generally speaking, in this period of time, you've got cavalry who are normally deployed on the flanks, but tend to have their role being something along the lines of uh, scout, harass, and when the enemy breaks, charge and cut them down. Uh, that tends to be the sort of <laughs> the pattern, except when it's not, uh, just we'll say that. But I think that each of these societies has these different kinds of fighting, and they're not necessarily distinguished by any particular kind of fighting style. And I think that when you look at some of the battles there, you know, the, the, the literary sources that we've got for these battles, of course, are centuries later, um, generally speaking, being written by historians in the case of Livy or even uh, dynasties of Helicarnassus. They're being written in an archaizing kind of way, and even one that's influenced by you know, their ideas about big history and their ideas about the, the development of, of, of Roman history, which might not necessarily be true. So you've got those different styles of fighting. There's, there's certain different types of uh, weaponry and uh, certain different types of armor that we associate with particular societies more than the others. But generally speaking, they're kind of similar. These cities are organized similarly. Um, they generally have kings or they have some kind of senate or they have some kind of chief. Um, so they will fight, the richest will fight. And again, it's probably a militia rather than anything else. So they're generally fighting only in the summer after the crops have been harvested and before they have to sow the next lot. So in that regard, uh, you've got very, very similar kinds of societies fighting. And the differentiation between them, where we can tell, is not really that great a distinction. And I think the interesting thing there, of course, is that when we come to think about Roman uh, societies, we think about the three lines and the triple ACs, and all, that either is an adopted and adapted method from some of the enemies that they fought. And one of the great things about Rome's development is, of course, they will pick and choose stuff to steal or adapt or borrow. Or... It's something that, as it grows, becomes a distinguishing feature. But again, those lines are based on wealth, and they're based on who gets the glory, rather than a, a, this sort of formulated plan that, that can only be fought in one way. And I would imagine that several of the other societies that they're fighting have similar systems uh, in that regard, even even down to lines of troops. And that also may, of course, be just a, an artificial creation of literature, and this idea of coming back to the war band idea that you've just got groups of men fighting and even clan warfare, that you've actually got family groups fighting, the Fabi uh, famously uh, in, in, is it 306, 406, 406, 406, yeah. You know, the 300 of them, shocking. Uh, same time as, you know, there's there's another 300 famously in, in an earlier period uh, in the Greek history. But, you know, that idea that you have a, a family and all their retainers fighting, you know, a battle, kind of like a group of thugs or a very, very disorganized militia, there's not going to be that organization that we later identify with Rome. And I think you can see sort of clusters and clumps of, of family groups put together uh, to create a bigger battlefront and that that then literarily has been turned into a, a system and made into a system and not denying that there is a system later. But I don't know that the system is there early in that period, um, other than you come from Rome or you come from uh, Vey or you come from you know a Samnite city or an Etruscan city. So I think that in that regard, you've got them all fighting similarly and you've got them fighting 
as they're not legions as such, but they are similarly sized units who fight with Rome when the, Rome needs them. And then, of course, as Roman citizenship expands, they become Italian Roman Romans because they're from Italy, and then, of course, they can become legionaries, and they do become legionaries. But I think that the idea of specialist fighting skills is a is a later development in uh, the late Republic rather than in the early development of Rome's expansion. I hope that helps, and I hope I haven't uh, piqued anyone's provocation with that. But comment, uh, send us a comment, send us a question, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.